Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here and we are here for another Marco Learning Saturday session. Very excited to be here for another DBQ example. Okay, hello Sophia. Um, hopefully we've got some other folks coming into the chat here. I'm just super happy to be here and super happy to announce that Marco Learning now has it has free, not three. We've got like 10 of them, um, but we've got free practice tests. Okay. So we've got free practice tests in a variety of subjects for the 2020 exam. And I'm going to be going through one of those practice tests. Okay. The one for AP European history. So we're going to be going through an AP European history practice test. And so with that, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, share my screen so that we can see exactly how to get to what I'm uh, going after here. So um, there should be, if you are watching on YouTube, there should be a link in the description um, that's going to go to Marco Learning Free Practice Test, okay? Hey there, James, and I'm glad to be here doing this. Hey, Theodore and Dan and Cyril, I'm glad to see y'all subscribing to the Marco Learning channel. So you go in here, Free Practice Test, and so I'm gonna click on European History. For some reason, they don't have these set up to click, but we wanna make sure that we click on that button there. And when we click on the button, uh, if you've already given your email address, then you can access this free practice test. And so you can do that in any of these subjects. You see that we've got a free practice test for 2020 in 10 AP subjects. So go ahead and download as many as you'd like, spread them far and wide, share them with your friends, and let's go into this for AP Euro. Now, again, if you go to uh, my website, I've got the rubric. We should all be familiar with the rubric by now, okay? But then again, you can always um, check out my website and go there. So we're going to do a little run through now. If you want to actually complete this DBQ before hearing me go over it, by all means, uh, hey, Victoria, thank you for the recent support on Instagram. I sure appreciate that. And it's always good uh, good to get y'all support on social media. Remember to follow at Marco Learning in addition to at Tom Ritchie. So with that, if you want to uh, hear me go over it now, that's fine. If you want to wait, that's fine too, okay? But let's go ahead and kind of think about how we would tackle a DBQ on the English Civil War. So let's go ahead and get right to it, shall we? All right. So as far as that goes, remember that the AP Euro DBQ is always going to be based on an either or proposition of which the, the best answers will go into some nuance. OK, the best answers will go into some nuance. So evaluate whether or not the English Civil War resulted in the establishment of a constitutional government in England. OK, so we're looking at the English Civil War. Now, note the 2017 prompt tackles the Glorious Revolution. Um, this one's kind of right up on that, but it's a different question because this is talking about the English Civil War specifically. Now, you want to think about this. Hopefully, you know a little bit about the English Civil War, and we think about its causes being the Stuart absolutism um, in England before the English Civil War. So we see the Stuart dynasty come in with James I and Charles I. And James I and Charles I were both advocates of divine right absolutism. Basically, God has put the king in their place, and it's the job of everyone else to go along with the king, this idea of the divine right of kings. Now, before that, of course, England had been through the Reformation. So there are two main issues when we think about the English Civil War. What is going to be the relationship between the king and parliament? And the other issue is what is going to be the status of religion and religious toleration and state religion? So let's go ahead and kind of get into this. And we're going to have to think of also, we want to think about a constitutional government. OK, so what is a constitutional government? A constitutional government, depending on how you define it, is typically a government that is limited and limited in certain ways. Uh, we could look at constitutional, at constitutional government as a government that is clearly defined or a government that is limited or limited and clearly defined. Uh, remember, it's not until the Glorious Revolution that you really have a solid constitutional foundation for England. So this is a debatable and argumentative question, depending on how you look at it and when you look at it. 
So document one, we see James the first, a speech before parliament in 1609. The state of monarchy is the supremest thing on earth for kings are not only God's lieutenants on earth and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself, they are called gods. Kings are justly called gods for they exercise they, that they exercise a manner or resemblance of divine power on earth. Now, as far as that goes, I should already be able to tell here that this is the divine right of kings, that James is articulating the doctrine of the divine right of kings. So that's something that I think is important to note here. Now you should have, if you don't already, you should have uh, one of these Marco learning practice guides. Okay. And I'll make sure to put a link in the description. Um, if I forget to do that, you can always go to my DBQ page, AP Euro DBQ page, and you can download this. Okay. So as we're going through this, we want to think about document one. Okay. Are we going to first of all use or strike? Now it's kind of like baseball. You can strike two documents and still have three to where you can write a solid DBQ with three pieces of documentary evidence, getting that point for two documents and also having kind of, uh, you know, a, a little bit of insurance there. So when we're thinking about this, briefly summarize the content in your own words. Now I could already tell that James the first is talking about the divine right of Kings. So James the first, um, speaks, uh, you know, uh, builds up the power of the monarchy and promotes the divine right of kings. Now, what argument could this document be used to support? What we want to note here is that absolutism existed before the English Civil War. OK, so we've got to think about this is the form of government that we're seeing. OK, we're seeing the divine right of kings. And so we'll see here. OK, but we see the way things were before that. All right. So then we think about the divine right of kings would be context. I've got a video lecture on the divine right of kings on my YouTube channel. So with that um, point of view, context, audience, or purpose, I would use context. Now you could also say, well, since he's a king, he is defending the power of kings or something like that. But I think context going into the doctrine of the divine right of kings would be your best bet here. So document two, okay, so when we look for document two, we scroll down here, we look at the Parliament of England, okay, so we should know something about Parliament that should be familiar to us. Um, this is uh, a statement by the Parliament of England after it was dissolved and then reassembled by Charles I, okay, so to the King's most excellent majesty. We humbly show unto our sovereign Lord, the King, the Lord spiritual and temporal and commons in parliament assembled that whereas it is declared and enacted by statute made in the time of the reign of King Edward, that no tallage or aid shall be laid or levied by the Kings or his heirs in this kingdom without the good will and assent of the archbishops, bishops, earls, da, 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 all these people. All right. So the authority of parliament holded five and 20th year, um, it is enacted. Okay. So we see here that, uh, you know, we see that there are things that the King cannot do. Now, some of y'all may think that this is getting a little bit deep into things. And remember that we've got the option to strike at least two documents. Okay. So you may decide that this is a little bit weighty for you and you don't want to use this document in which sense that is, in which case that is okay. So we could say that we're going to strike the document or we can note here, if you know what the petition of right is, then you would be in a position to say that parliament is protesting against abuses of power by Charles the first. Okay. So we see what we're look, looking at here, another strategy. Now on the first document, I read just a little bit of it and stopped the second document. I could go into the first paragraph and then when it starts to get dense, maybe let me skip to the second paragraph. They do hum therefore humbly pray your most excellent majesty that no man hereafter may be compelled to make or yield any gift, loan, benevolence, tax, or make such charge without common consent of act by parliament. So what they're wanting is for the king to consult with parliament. And we could use some outside evidence here, such as Charles's personal rule or when Charles tried to institute a change in the collection of ship money. OK, I've got to say that very carefully. Ship money, ship money, ship money. OK, that's always I've got to make sure to put that into 
um, into context here um, so that people don't think I'm saying something else. So ship money. That would be a good example of outside evidence, okay? So, so far, we've seen the foundations of absolutism by James I and Charles I. Now, then we know the English Civil War starts, okay? So, now we see here 1648, okay? Now, notice here that we're seeing memoirs that are published posthumously. These memoirs are published 50 years later. So when we see something like this, now anytime you're looking at memoirs, that is of course the same root as memory. It's not something that's happening right at the time. It's something that is, you know, these are my recollections of what happened. So, uh, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, maybe one day, 30 years from now, be like, you know, memoirs of a second tier YouTuber or something like that. And I'll be talking about things that happened way back, okay? And so going from going from there, we see here the memoir. So we want to know that we've got a POV that kind of went into our lap. Anytime that we're looking at memoirs, especially something published 50 years later, we're thinking in terms of, okay, I can note here that his recollections may not have been precise. Also, people who write memoirs tend to be self-serving in their memoirs. They want to make themselves look good. So the day following, some of the principal officers of the army came to London and consulted with some members of parliament and others. It was concluded after a full and free debate that measures taken by the parliament were contrary to the trust reposed in them and tending to contract the guilt of the blood that had been shed upon themselves and the nation, that it was decided that it was therefore the duty of the army to endeavor to put a stop to such proceedings, having engaged in war, not simply as mercenaries, but out of judgment and conscience, being convicted that the cause in which they engaged was just and that the good of the people was involved in it. Being come to this resolution, three of the members of the house and three of the officers of the army withdrew into a private room to consider the best means to attain the ends of our said resolution, where we agreed that the army should be drawn up the next morning, guards placed in Westminster Hall, that none might be permitted to pass into the house, but such as had been continued faithful to the public interest. Now you'll note here when they talk about the public interest, he's using the term public interest to go with interest of the army, interest of the roundheads. Now that's one thing we can think about. We've never seen cavaliers and roundheads. So we're already trying to think about some outside evidence that we could put into here, right? And so to this end, we went over the names of all the members one by one, giving the truest characters um, that we could to their inclination, wherein I presume we were not mistaken in many. For the parliament was fallen into such factions and divisions, yada, yada, yada. And so we note here uh, that, you know, we could keep reading. Again, a lot of times you can spend a lot of time reading that you don't necessarily need to. You should be able at a certain point to understand that the army is interfering with the parliament. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that the army is interfering with the parliament. Francesca, I am uh, happy to hear you. Uh, now, as far as that goes, uh, could I explain how to source? Yeah, we can We can go into, we can certainly go into, into that. Uh, now, this picture may or may not be the best one for that, but we can talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, the hip, ha happy, whatever we're going to do. All right. So as far as that, Kayla, I will go into notes in another broadcast. Look for something from Marco Learning before the exam. Okay, looks like Victoria, we've got a pog in the chat over there. So, you know, look for something before the exam actually starts. Um, hey there, uh, hey there, Elliot, glad to see you here. And James, okay. So outside evidence, very good. You could go into the King James Bible. James is noting of all people, you could go into the King James Bible, but King James was the same one who did the King James version of the Bible. And that was part of his program of divine right absolutism. Okay, so, so with that, uh, we should be able to see, like in that document, we should be able to see 
Okay, there we go. Gosh, that would have been embarrassing if I couldn't get that open. I did, hey, can you? Uh, would you mind putting some water? Thank you so much. I got to stay hydrated. Okay, that would have been embarrassing if I couldn't open that. Um, but uh, yeah, I had to do a little dad, a little dad moment there. Um, how can you manage your time, Victoria? One of the things I say about managing your time. Notice the stuff I'm saying here about uh, about not reading the entire document. About you noticed how document two. I told you if you feel like you're getting bogged down, you don't know what's going going on, just strike it. Okay. One of the best ways to save time is to resolve to write three, you know, to put three documents into your essay and then have, you know, good um, POV plus to have good outside evidence and to have a strong thesis. Um, you can easily get an eight out of 10 using only three of the five documents. So that's one thing. Then making sure once you understand what's in the document or once you decide to strike a document, get rid of it. Now, the third thing on time management uh, that we want to note here is when we consider, um, when we do time management, doing your contextualization last. Okay. So you want to make sure that you're doing your contextualization last, not first. Okay. Because if you do your contextualization last, then you are in a situation where, you know, if you don't get to contextualization, it is not, uh, you know, it's not the worst thing that ever happened. You just lose one point. Okay. So, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that's something that is important. Um, the notes thing. Yeah. That, that Marco learning will be putting out some guidelines on notes before the exam. We're not quite there yet. Right now we are putting our efforts into making sure that we've got, you know, good DBQs for you and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so going from going from there with document three, we should be at a point where we can go in, you know, where we can understand the armies taking control of the parliament. And if you know anything about the English Civil War, you know that it led to essentially a military dictatorship. Okay, so it led essentially to a military dictatorship. And so going from there. Um, you know, when we're thinking about uh, this, uh, you know, we're thinking about this military dictatorship, um, what we're going to see here is we see a visual source here. OK, so a satirical image of Oliver Cromwell produced in the Netherlands around 1655. Now, how would we do our POV plus for a visual source here? OK, so we can see here that uh, now, first of all, this is something that was, uh, you know, from the best information we have produced in the Netherlands. And then we look, uh, we look here and Cromwell. OK, so Oliver Cromwell, note he's dressed up like a king. OK, so he's dressed up like a king. Now we note here the way that we can do this is we can see that the person, like if we're thinking about how to do POV plus on an image, we see that obviously this person is not a fan of Oliver Cromwell. Okay. So, so you see here that Cromwell is holding all of the symbols essentially that although Cromwell took on the title of Lord Protector, that he is functioning as a king. So when we see this, we could also note that perhaps it was produced in the Netherlands and we can note there that that's how people looked at this from the outside, that it wasn't just, pe you know, people from outside of England saw that Cromwell was, uh, you know, was serving as a monarch. And this is not coming from within England, but this is the impression people are getting um, that are outside observers who don't necessarily have a horse in the race. So when we look at this, documents three and four certainly point to, when you think about the protectorate, it doesn't look constitutional. Now, if any of y'all are familiar with the rump parliament, basically document three is uh, what they call pride's purge, which was the purge of everyone from parliament who wanted to, uh, you know, who wanted to keep Charles the first alive, who was against the execution of Charles the first. And so we see here that if, if we look at the protectorate, we really don't see a constitutional government forming. 
And then when we go to, uh, finally, we've got document five, okay, the Parliament of England, okay? So we see here um, an act for preventing dangers which may happen from popish recusants, okay? So for preventing dangers, yada, 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 okay? So then again, remember that when we're thinking about this, we want to kind of go through and find whatever is going to be the, the easiest thing to do here, okay? So, so as far as that goes, where we're looking at this for preventing dangers, okay, be it enacted by the king's most, now note popish recusants, we should know popish, that's having to do with Catholics, right? Um, so with the advice and consent of the Lord's spiritual and temporal and of the commons, this present parliament assembled and by authority of the same that all and every person or persons as well as peers and commoners that shall bear any office or offices, civil or military, shall receive any pay, salary, fees, or wages, yada, yada, yada. And let's note here, uh, let's think about something like this that I'm going to think about um, maybe skipping here, okay? And thinking this is getting a little bit dense uh, you know, we're thinking about this, that, okay, now we're looking at the Lord's Supper. Oh, okay, so let's see here. And said the respective officers aforesaid shall also receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper according to the usage of the Church of England. And in some parish church upon some of the Lord's Day, commonly called Sunday, immediately after divine service and sermon. Now, one thing we would note here is when we're when we're looking at this, um, what we're seeing is we should this should be ringing a bell. Sometimes a DBQ, um, you know, the language may be weird, but you're like, wait, I think I remember. What is this? Anybody getting what this is? This is what we would know is the Test Act. Okay, so be it further enacted by the authority aforesaid that at the same time when the persons concerned in this act shall take the aforesaid oaths of supremacy and allegiance, they shall likewise make and subscribe this declaration following under the same penalties and forfeitures as by this act is appointed. I do declare that I do believe that there is not any transubstantiation. Now, note here, that's where you've got an explanatory note. Now, you probably should know what that is, but just to be sure, a Catholic belief that during the Christian religious service, the bread and wine consumed by believers become the body and blood of Christ, okay? So, so you note here what's going on here. We've got the test acts. Now, this may be another one. That some people, you know, if you don't recognize this as the test acts, that could be a tough thing for you. Okay. So, so as far as that goes, Elliot, he loves the test act. That's interesting. Okay. That's not really in the 21st uh, century, something you hear a lot of. So as far as, as far as that goes back, uh, you know, when we're thinking about this, how far back do we need to know English monarchs? Yeah, the War of the Roses is about the starting point of the course, James, to answer your question there. So um, as far as as far as that goes, what we want to what we want to note here is you either recognize the test acts or you did not. OK, now what we've got to do here is we've got to think about a way to put this together. And remember, we want to have three documents and we want to get into, uh, you know, using a couple of pieces of outside evidence and doing our uh, you know, doing our POV plus. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a little Google document here. Last week I did this on a word file and then my computer, I uh, did a surprise restart. Okay. So Marco English civil war DDQ. It did a surprise restart and I lost my work. So, you know, use Google documents uh, whenever you, whenever you can. Now we're going to make this Google has done some things where they updated some of their stuff here. So we've created something here and I'm going to, um, I'm going to give you this. Now, my, my standard thing about the complexity point, Suha, is that if you're asking about the complexity point now, don't worry about it. Okay. If you're not a hundred percent sure how to earn it, it's earned by very, very few people. Okay. So you want to make sure that you are uh, you know, that just don't worry about it. It's 1 point in 10. Very few people are going to get it. A lot of people are going to try and get it. They're not going to get it. Okay. So going from here, what we need to do here is we need to come up with an argument. 
did this set up a constitutional government okay and what i'm going to say here is that it did not okay so so we'll note here that my my general argument okay so argument um it did not uh because uh you know cromwell's government continued uh you know heavy-handed you know you know ruled as a dictatorship okay so what i'm going to say here is i'm going to say that we've got stuart absolutism okay so you've got stuart absolutism and then you've got cromwell's dictatorship okay and what i'm going to note here is that it was you know this was also absolute okay so this was also absolute stuart absolutism is of course absolute uh so we're going to note here that first of all we would use document one i think the three most accessible documents are document one james the first and then when we're going to look at uh, our pov plus i'm going to say historical context i'm going to say document one i'm going to use historical context so that's going to be my that's going to be what i'm going to do there and that is in line with the marco learning dbq guide and note that that is on uh you know my dbq page or you might be able to find it at marcolearning.com but a lot of you should already have this if you don't um somebody posted it in one of these uh chats here let me go ahead and oh actually wait that was the one i just posted um, so with that, yes, we've got uh, we've got this here. Let me make sure that those of you in the YouTube chat have a direct thing here. Yeah, complexity would be with a counter argument, but don't worry about complexity right now. I just I really think that it is a mistake. Remember, Star Wars Day is Monday. Don't try it, Anakin. I have the high ground. You know that's uh, you know listen to Obi Wan Kenobi. So document three and document four okay so document four is of course the uh you know cromwell as king okay and then document three is the mil military takes over parliament okay so when we look there and then you know here i would note as james noted the king james bible okay so basically absolute control over religion okay so everyone must be anglican okay so everyone must be anglican uh now here i'm going to note we'll go into the english civil war um i'm going to say cavaliers uh you know so english civil war cavaliers roundheads okay so roundheads in the english civil war now for contextualization what i can do here is i can contextualize the age of absolutism okay so i can just contextualize the age of absolutism if i even get there i may not even do contextual well i may show you that just to, just so we've got it okay but what i'm going to do here i'm going to say here that there was not okay there was not a constitutional government so i'm going to start off with my thesis so let's go ahead and start with that now actually i've been not screen sharing so let me go ahead and uh and do a screen share all right, so we're going to go ahead and make sure that my screen is being shared. Uh, May the 13th be with you. That's funny. Yeah, so may the 13th be with you. That's that's great. All right, so so with that, um, let's go ahead and go, you know, now you can see what I'm doing here. So basically, Stuart Absolutism, document one. Now then I'm going to go into um, with document four. Okay, so my POV plus. POV plus, um, I may go into like three and then I'm going to go, I like historical context, but then again, I teach history. So it's easy for me. Okay. So with this, what I'm going to say here is the English civil war. Okay. Civil war did not result in the establishment of a constitutional government in England because uh, you know, Cromwell, you know, Cromwell's military dictatorship ship, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, did not give Parliament any more freedom than, uh, you know, they had had under the Stuart, you know, under the absolute rule of the Stuarts, you know, of the, of the Stuarts or of 
James the first and Charles the first okay so what I'm doing here I don't have to go through the restoration now document uh, document five was a restoration document after the restoration of the monarchy I don't have to go that far okay I don't have to go that far so what we're going to see here is that's my thesis statement okay so I've got I'm noting the military dictatorship in a way I'm going into comparison is what I'm really doing here is that compared to James the first and uh, Charles the first it's really not any different okay so under you know so what I'm gonna note here is under James the first and Charles the first First, England was under the absolute rule of kings who tried to rule without parliament. Sure. All right. So kings who tried to rule without parliament. Okay. So we see here now we're going to go into James the first. Okay. So King James the first, James the first said that kings are like little gods. Okay. So little gods and that God expects people to treat kings on earth like they would treat God, okay? Um, so, God in heaven. Now, document one. Now, what I'm going to do here is now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contextualize. I'm going to say that James, uh, you know, in the speech to Parliament, James was advocating for the divine right of kings. Now, one thing that you want to do is you probably need to think about having a typo policy as far as are you going to go back and catch your typos when they happen or do you want to just go back later and get all your typos at once? The latter might be a little bit more efficient, but it's not more natural to do it by catching them all at once. But something you want to think about. So the divine right of kings, okay, which was a common belief during the age of absolutism. So a common belief during the age of absolutism that kings, kings were appointed by God and should have absolute power. Okay. So one power, um, you know, one power that James claimed was over the religion of his subjects okay so with the religion of his subjects um he published the king james bible and forced everyone in england to be anglican okay so what we would note here is this oh goodness okay so um my daughter's cooking dinner that's going to be going for a little bit i'll turn it off okay it's done all right sorry about that so with that, uh, forced everyone in England to be Anglican. This angered um, the Puritans, okay, who were English Calvinists. Okay, so in narrating a little bit about the causes of the English Civil War, um, then we're we're going to see that that's going to uh, you know that's going to contribute to outside evidence who were English Calvinists um, who did not want to be in the Anglican church okay not want to be in the anglican church or actually did not uh you know did not approve okay to be to be specific because that sounds like separatist okay of the direction of the anglican church finding it to catholic okay so finding it to catholic so what we have here is we've got a clear and argumentative topic sentence okay so when we look at this it is a clear and argumentative topic sentence okay and so we see here that everything's going to be about steward absolutism we have a reference to document one right so document one used you know it basically supports argument okay so document one supports argument then as we go into the divine right of kings um we see here that uh we have our contextualization okay so context for so basically historical context for document one okay so historical context for document one uh, and then we see here where we've got some outside evidence okay so outside evidence 
All right, so so we're going to note here, now we're going to go into the English Civil War and its immediate legacy. Remember, this essay is not going to address the Restoration at all. It's leaving out that last uh, thing on the test acts. So as far as that goes, we're going to go from here and we'll say that, uh, you know, that tensions between the king, you know, between Charles I and Parliament led to the English Civil War, which uh, resulted in the fall of one absolute government uh, in, with, that would be replaced by another, another one. Okay, so basically by a dictatorship. Okay, so we note here that we're going to go back and look here and then I'm going now what you'll notice is a lot of times like we want a good social distance between our outside evidence and the documents. I'm going to go ahead and put the Cavaliers and the Roundheads together. Now, most of the time you'll note most of the time my outside evidence is either going to be at the end of the paragraph or immediately after the topic sentence. I don't prefer to mix in my outside evidence with the documents. Remember, social distancing here uh, is very important. So when we get into this, okay, that it would be replaced by a dictatorship. Um, so in the English Civil War, those who supported the king were called uh, were called uh, Cavaliers, and those who supported Parliament and the Puritans were called roundheads because of how they wore their hair. Okay, so of how they wore their hair. Um, we'll say here that, uh, you know, the roundheads won the war and executed King Charles. Okay, so King, King Charles the first. All right, so here, I've got, again, an argumentative topic sentence arguing that a dictatorship is established. So clear and argumentative topic sentence. So a clear and argumentative topic sentence. And then we go from here that we see that now we've got our outside evidence. OK, so remember that what we are urging you to do, OK, in this uh, this Marco learning guide is when you go you go through the documents and then you're setting this up in terms of. What's your point of body paragraph one? What documents are you using? What outside evidence supports your argument? Same for body paragraph two. And so we want a POV plus and a piece of outside evidence in each paragraph. And there you go. So going from there, uh, we see here the roundheads won and executed Charles the first. OK, um, but the roundheads. But the roundhead victory did not result in constitutionalism because the military began uh, interfering with parliament. Okay, so, so what we'll note here, and again, figure out what your typo policy is. I'm gonna fix them as they happen, but figure out what you wanna do. So interfering with parliament. So in 1648, um, the, you know, the, army, uh, it, the army surrounded the parliament building and, uh, you know, and only let people in who supported the policies that the army wanted. OK, so we see here that that is document three. OK, so we see there is document three. All right. So now we can see here context. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to do document four. I think I'm going to do document four. So Cromwell as king. OK, so, uh, you know, so Cromwell, you know, Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the uh, Roundheads, ruled as Lord Protector. OK, so Protector, um, this is kind of like, you know, I can make a Lord of the Rings reference here. It's kind of like when you think about Gondor had the steward, right? So ruled as Lord Protector, but he exercised, you know, he basically exercised the powers of the of a king. OK, so, uh, you know, this can be seen in an image produced in the Netherlands that showed Cromwell with a crown. 
okay, that showed Cromwell with a crown. So this would be image produced in the Netherlands that showed Cromwell with a crown and holding uh, symbols of royalty, okay? So we would say here that, uh, you know, that we see here that we've got document, uh, this is document four, okay? Now one thing, we, yes, yeah, so we got document three, and document four. And so with this, now we'll go in here at and say something like this. Since this image uh, was produced in another country, okay, this is uh, this is not just the view of Cromwell's enemies in England, but the view of people who are outside of the situation okay giving it more credibility okay uh, so when we think about that how credible is this image uh, so we see here we started with the topic sentence we've got here outside evidence and then we've got document three okay so we see here document three is used argumentatively and then we've got here a little bit of historical context for document four. Okay, so this is context for document four. And then we have a reference to document four. Now, remember, you only have to do one of the four things when you're doing your POV plus, but sometimes you might want to do more than one. It's just good writing. It makes everything look better. So we see here the image produced, uh, you know, here with him with the crown. So we see here document four is used argumentatively. Okay. So when you go from there, then that is where we're going to do some POV analysis, just kind of be extra, but somebody asked, how would we do something on a visual document? So I wanted to show you a couple of things we can see. We can, I think one of the easiest things to do is to contextualize a visual document. But of course, I also teach the subject. So, so contextualizing documents comes easily for me. So when we think about this, uh, we've got here that uh, this is POV analysis for document four. OK, and so going from uh, going from here now, I'm finished with my essay. OK, so I've got uh, at this point uh, the points that I've earned. I've got a thesis statement. I've got three documents that I understand. They're used argumentatively. I have two pieces of outside evidence, and then I've got two examples of POV plus. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, I'm pretty sure the Glorious Revolution deals that. Yeah, so that is exactly okay. Car parliament and you know, the Rump Parliament. Now, one thing to do here, Theodore, we could go into the Rump Parliament to give context for Document Three. That would be something here. Um, so there, the English Restoration. Okay, so no, no, the, if you're thinking about the English Restoration and the Glorious Revolution. Okay, so good. Now we see we've got a little bit of studying to do here. I've got a full series of lectures on the Stuarts on my YouTube channel. Okay, so YouTube.com, uh, Tom Ritchie. Um, go ahead and you can look if you look James the first, Charles the first, Charles the second, James the second. Okay, so those will be there if you're thinking, hey, I need to review this a little bit because I got the English Civil war confounded with the the glorious revolution which you don't want to do right okay so as far as that uh as far as that goes um oh for some reason i've got uh i've got this twice okay so i've got this open in two places okay so as far as that goes um we can see here that i've got that done so now i'm going to go back and do contextualization now for options for contextualization i could um, you know, go into maybe the death of Elizabeth uh, the first, um, you know, and go into that. I could go into the Tudors or I could go into the age of absolutism, uh, you know, in, in particular. OK, so. What I would note here, OK, so. So, so what we would see here is on the European continent. OK, so in the you know, so so we note here that, uh, you know, in the, you know, in the 1600s or, you know, in the early 17th century, you eat a lot, you know, several European countries were moving toward absolutism. OK, so absolutism. Now I'm going to explain what that is. OK, a system of government that gave 
sovereign power to the king, okay, who was not who was not accountable, who was not accountable to representatives to represent representative bodies okay so it's not accountable to representative bodies uh you know so we're going to note that um in the holy roman empire okay so in the holy roman empire frederick william the great elector of of brandenburg um became an absolute ruler ruler with the power to tax without consent okay so uh this became you know so building what would later become prussia okay so say what would later become prussia now then i would note uh, i would note something about this that we could say that uh you know louis the 14th uh, you know, also began, okay, so began building, of course, that's not necessarily early 10th, you know, century, but Louis the 14th also built an absolute state in France, okay, so controlling, uh, you know, the nobility um, at his palace at Versailles, okay. The English, however, resisted absolutism and fought a civil war war in response to absolutist policies okay so absolutism um in response to absolutist policies uh with the you know client you know hoping hoping to give power to parliament okay so that's what i would do there if i had time you know this would be contextualization okay if i've got time after i finish my body paragraphs this is what i would consider contextualization and so with that that's one way to do it okay but remember the two documents that you find to be least useful make sure to think about that now could you uh yeah i think uh you know the vicky you could definitely go into the glorious revolution and britain's uh you know shift there so the glorious rep revolution could be like a a reverse context like instead of going at the beginning we can say what's going to happen later what i'd call reverse context but it's still context so yeah we could do context at the end how is historical context pov plus pov plus what i'm talking about is point of view context audience and purpose so that's one of the four things i used to say pov cap but i think pov plus works better so i just use that that's my terminology but when i say pov plus it is shorthand for point of view context audience and purpose and so can the other side of the argument the dbq um be argued would consider to be no uh the vicky we can go with either one okay we can go with either side here so yes please do re-watch those videos make sure to watch the ads so the other side of the argument can be argued would it be considered more wrong no you could if i were going for a constitutional system i would use document five i would go into the restoration or we could say that it led to okay here's the thing you could make a more complex argument that's saying that it led to the eventual creation of a constitutional system through the events of the glorious revolution so again when they give you these things i think that's a great question viviki when we think about in terms of the uh you know that yeah this is an argumentative question they're always going to give you an argumentative question so contextualization william i typically say three good content rich sentences so the amount of detail that i've put into uh the you know into this i think that that's going to be something that is uh, important to just kind of note. So the amount of the amount of detail that I put into here is, you know, I think sufficient um, to pretty much guarantee the point. Okay. So uh, let's see. So you know, so for the Google document, okay let me just make sure i've got the link to the google document and remember okay so 
Um, so y'all are subscribed to the Marco Learning YouTube channel, I hope, if you're here. So, you know, thank y'all for supporting Marco Learning. Uh, thank y'all for supporting me. And I will be back at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern next week, okay? And also remember, I've got the Corona class on my YouTube channel through my Crowdcast. We'll be doing plenty more things, okay? So as far as that goes, I don't have... Uh, a, I don't have lectures on the Hanovers, but that's something that, uh, you know, I may get into the Hanoverian dynasty at another time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for joining me. And it is always a pleasure.